Oh, good morning. If you can hear my voice, would you honk your horn for me? That's a beautiful sound on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you. We're glad you're here and have chosen to worship with us. Would you lift your voice and sing on a hill far away? Stood an old rugged cross. Would you lift your voice with us this morning as we worship together? On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love, and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Continue to worship together this morning, declaring as a, as, a, as a whole body this morning, one body, unified whole, our need for Christ in our lives. Would you sing this morning, Lord, I need you every hour. I need you. Let's sing. Lord, I come, I confess.
God's people said. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1. The word of God says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you that I may joyfully be filled. I'm reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded, now lives in you also. Let's pray. Almighty God, it is in the name of Jesus that we bow in your presence, and we do acknowledge that we need you. We need you for the grace that saves. We need you for the grace that continues to sustain us. And on this special day, along with the Apostle Paul, as he thinks back to the mother and the grandmother, of Timothy and the influence that they were on his life. Lord, we do pause on this day and thank you for our mothers and grandmothers. We thank you for the incredible influence they were and the representative of Christ's love to us. And today we pray that you would wrap your loving arms around them, that they would understand your great love, that they would appreciate the honor that you want expressed to mothers, and we pray that today would be a source of that. We ask that you would use this service to uh, lift up the name of Jesus. You would use this service to encourage the saints, that you would use it to evangelize sinners. And Lord, I pray for our mothers today that you would use this service as a way to encourage them. Father, we ask your continued blessing upon our church. We ask your blessing upon our nation as we continue to deal with this COVID-19 virus. We pray that you would give the medical personnel and the scientists wisdom and discernment as they continue to search for a cure. Lord, we pray that you would be with our medical personnel as they continue to administer care. And our first responders, we ask for your hand of favor to rest upon them, that you would strengthen them and sustain them by your power and by your grace. And Father, we ask now as we worship in this place that you would Show yourself strong to your people. It is you we seek today, and we ask that you would use this service to increase our faith. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our Mother's Day service, to our drive-in worship. Thank you so very much for uh, choosing to worship with us today. Uh, Several announcements that I do need to make. One, I want to go ahead and express our appreciation as a church particularly me as a pastor, and uh, you as a church, a lot of things taking place behind the scenes that you don't see, but I greatly appreciate the work that Daniel does to make this service happen along with David Allen and Cliff. Uh, They work tirelessly making sure that all of the, the technology works like it's supposed to. We're also broadcasting our service online this morning. We will continue to do that, and I appreciate the way that Uh, These individuals work and serve uh, our church and Christ, making this possible. 
I thank our deacons as they work uh, to make sure everybody gets parked uh, like they need to. Thank you so much. Watch them as they, as you leave the service today, they'll direct you as you leave. You'll also notice that they will have some fishing nets as you leave. Uh, we're not trying to catch any fish, but if you do have any offering with you, we do want to catch that before you leave. And as we think about offering, I do want to, again, commend you as a church family uh, for your faithful giving during this time. Uh, you have been so faithful that we've been able to continue with our ministry here and uh, continue to pay our personnel. So you continue to be faithful, and thank you so much for that. Again, you can give online. You can mail your offerings in. You can bring them by the church. So uh, thank you for your continued faithfulness in supporting the church financially. Also, I've uh, been asked, what are we going to do for our upcoming services? And I uh, just want to give you a brief announcement. We'll continue to communicate to you uh, on the website, uh, also by email and by Facebook. Uh, we will continue to do the live stream services on Sunday for the next couple of weeks. We're going to experiment doing the on-campus uh, worship services starting on Wednesday night. And we won't meet in the parking lot on Wednesday. We'll meet in the worship center on Wednesday. We're going to start that on Wednesday night. That'll give us a little bit of a practice run, give you a practice run as you worship and maintain social distance before we open up the church with uh, our, our Sunday services and open up the campus with multiple services and all that has to take place, making sure that you're safe. Again, just because we uh, can meet and the governor has said that there's now going to be uh, – no more restrictions on us gathering for worship. There's still a lot of things that we need to do to make sure that you're safe. Uh, a lot of our uh, Sunday school teachers, even our children's department, even our, our senior adults are high risk for the virus. And so we want to continue to make sure that everyone is safe. We will begin probably just with worship services only and gradually move to our uh, Sunday school classes but what I'm asking you to do is just uh, continue to be patient with us. Watch for the announcements. Uh, sometimes uh, we're making that announcement on the, the day before or the day of, uh, indicating what we're going to be doing that particular night. We'll try to keep you as informed as possible, but we ask you to please be patient with us as we work through this. Again, thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today. We believe God's going to do a great work as a result of us gathering in this place for his glory. Thank you so much for being here. Well, let's continue to worship together this morning. One day, he's going to make everything new and every wound he will bind. And we'll see Jesus face to face. If you're excited for that day, could you say amen this morning? It's going to be a great day. Let's lift our voices together. One day, you'll make everything new. One day, you'll bind everyone. Let's sing together this morning as we worship. One day, you'll make everything new. Jesus, one day, you'll bind everyone. The former things shall all pass away. No more tears And one day you'll make sense of it all Jesus, one day every question resolved And every anxious thought left behind No more fear Do you lift your voice when we all get to heaven? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. One day we will see face to face. Is there a greater vision of grace? And in a moment we shall be changed on that day. And one day we'll be free, free indeed. Jesus, one day all the struggles will cease. And we will see a glory. 
going to be and we're going to sing. We're going to shout the victory of Jesus. Amen. Would you sing with me? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When Shout the victory. We'll sing and shout the victory. I'm going to God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your love and your grace. There is no greater vision of grace than what's coming our way when we see you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator of the world and everything in it face to face. Lord, this morning we celebrate our mothers and the the beauty that they hold and the role that they play and how they mold us and shape us into who we are. Lord, we thank you for that picture of your grace through our mothers this morning. We thank you for each and every one one of them who's gathered here this morning. And we pray your blessings over them. Lord, we also ask your blessings over the remaining time that we have together this morning as we continue to lift high the name of Jesus. But I pray that you'd be with Pastor Steve as he comes in just a second to deliver the message that you've placed on his heart that you know we need to hear today as a congregation. I pray that you'd use him mightily as an instrument of your glory as he does what he does every single week, as he lifts high your name and as he proclaims the truth of the gospel. Lord, I pray that your hand would rest over him and that you'd use him in a mighty, mighty way. And as a congregation, may we be open and receptive to the moving of your spirit through the teaching of your word this morning. Lord, bless this day. Use it as only you can to lift high yourself, to draw people into your presence. Lord, we ask you to save souls. Father, we love you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, praise team. Let me ask if you would please to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 2, the gospel of John chapter 2. Our text this morning is John chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. 
I'll be reading out of the NIV translation, John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The Word of God says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you to do. Let's pray. Almighty God, it is in the name of Jesus that we bow in your presence, coming now to the preaching of your word. I pray that you would anoint me as your messenger, that my message not be with just wise and persuasive words, but a demonstration of the Spirit's power, that men's faith rests not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of Almighty God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, my Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. Today I claim your promise that your word is alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, that your word is like the rain in the snow which does not go forth without accomplishing your purpose, that your word, as the prophet Jeremiah declared, is like a hammer that shatters a rock to pieces. Your word is like a fire that burns in a man's soul. Today, Father, I claim that promise that Jesus is the word of God, so it is my prayer this morning that you would open the eyes of our heart that we might have a fresh encounter with the risen Savior. I ask this in his holy, strong name. Amen. Today is Mother's Day, and I came across a list of, uh, of Murphy's Law of Parenting. Those who are familiar with Murphy's Law is that if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Somebody wrote a list of some Murphy's Laws of Parenting. See if you understand or can relate to any of these. Number one, the later you stay up, the earlier your child will wake up the next morning. The gooier the food, the more likely it is to end up on the carpet. Number three, the longer it takes you to prepare a meal, the less your child will like it. Number four, a sure way to get something done is to tell a child not to do it. Number five, for a child to become clean, something else must become dirty. Number six, toys multiply to fill any space available. Number seven, yours is always the only child who doesn't behave in a group setting. Number eight, if a shoe fits, it's too expensive. Number nine, backing out of the car or backing the car out of the driveway always causes your child to go to the bathroom. Those are Murphy's Laws of Parenting, perhaps some Mothers can relate to one mother who was uh, interviewed. She had three children, and the reporter asked her, said, if you had it to do all over again, would you still have children? She responded immediately, said, oh, yes, of course I would have children. And then she added, maybe not the same three children. Christianity sometimes has been falsely accused of not giving women the honor that they need, but usually that criticism comes from those who have a poor understanding of Scripture. It is true that God has created men and women differently. He has assigned them different roles that they are to perform. But the Bible clearly reveals that women are equal to men, and perhaps you can make the argument from Scripture they are superior to men. To appreciate the value of women, we only need to look at the revelation contained in creation The biblical account is a story of origins, but it's also presented as a work of art. Think of something like the Sistine Chapel or Venus de Milo or Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or Handel's Messiah. Creation is an amazing work of art unfolding like colors on a canvas until the master completes his final product. We never fully appreciate the full beauty of women and the honor of women until we understand the progressive work of creation, which begins in darkness without form. And then God said, let there be light, pure, magnificent, radiant light. After light, God creates water and land. Imagine emerald green oceans and crystal clear mountain streams. And then like a master painter with large sweeping movements establishing the background for the painting, God fills the land with grass and plants and trees. He turns his attention back to the sky saying, let there be lights in heaven. Only in recent years have scientists begun to grasp the magnitude of the solar system and other galaxies. 
Job 38, 7 says the morning star sings his praise. Psalm 19, verse 1 says the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies declare the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. The masterpiece is becoming more intricate, more beautiful, more gracious, more glorious, and more intimate as living creatures are now added to creation. Starting with rocks and trees, the earth is now filled with animals of every size and shape. Whales, dolphins, and sharks, along with fish of a thousand colors, occupy the ocean. Horses and elk and buffalo gallop across the plains. The symphony is building toward its climax. Each act of creation ascends in beauty, power, and glory. What was once without form is now and lifeless is now abounding with purpose and glory. Rocks can be inspiring, but a whale leaping in the ocean is far more amazing. Birds may be interesting, but they're not as majestic as a lion roaring on the African plain. All that has been created is just the foundation for the final act, which God will create something so marvelous that it will contain his image. God forms Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed life, creating man in his own image. After six days of incredible labor, Come to an end, man stands as the triumph of all creation. Man, not animals or any other created thing, is given the quality of possessing the image of God. But as the great pinnacle of creation, something is still missing, and that something is a woman. Eve becomes the final act of creation. The woman is the last finishing touch of God's masterpiece. Understanding how creation unfolds from the mundane to the majestic, from the simple to the spectacular, we appreciate that women are the most incredible, most beautiful, most breathtaking, most glorious act of all creation. It's as if God said, now that's the best I can do. There's nothing better. And after creating Eve, who represents all women, God stops his creative work and rests. Because Eve is the finishing touch of creation, we would expect her along with other mothers to be placed in a position of honor, which is exactly what we find when God gives the Ten Commandments recorded for us in Exodus chapter 20. For many of us, we're so familiar with that command that children are to honor their fathers and mothers that we take it for granted, not recognizing how radically different and significant that was from that culture and that time that women would be placed in an equal honor with men. The biblical account is clear. Women are the greatest expression of God's creative glory and worthy of honor. And today on Mother's Day, we seek to honor mothers. For our text today, I've chosen the story of Jesus and the turning of water to wine, which is the first miracle of seven recorded in John's gospel. John would state at the end of this gospel, there are many other miracles that Jesus performed, but he chose these seven as a way to communicate who Christ is. And he calls those miracles signs because they revealed the glory of God. Usually, this particular text is studied from the perspective of the deity of Christ, But today on Mother's Day, I want us to consider the passage by concentrating on the mother of Jesus as she gives the best advice any mother or any parent, for that matter, could ever give a child. If you're taking notes this morning, the first point in the message is the location of love. I want you to consider the question, where is love? Listen how John begins this passage in The second chapter, he says, the mother of Jesus was there. Genuine love is expressed in presence. Not the type of presence that you wrap and place under a Christmas tree, but presence spelled P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. The event that John is describing is the wedding of Cana. Yet in a real sense, Mary was always there and present for Jesus. Her love surrounded him. Her values influenced him. Her trust supported him. And one of the last thoughts that Jesus had when he was on the cross was for his mother. The Scripture says as he hung on the cross that he looked at John and said, John, behold your mother. And then he looked at his mom and said, behold your son. To effectively lead our children, we need to be there for them. 
One wise family counselor said the best way you spell love is T-I-M-E. Are you spending time with your children? Are you actively engaged in conversation and shared experiences? Dinner time used to be a sacred tradition where families shared about their day, but now many families don't eat together. And if they do eat at the same table, they're often scrolling through their phones while they're at the table. Several years ago, Focus on the Family said the average parent spent less than seven minutes a day actively engaged with their school-aged children. If there's been one good thing about this COVID-19 pandemic is that it has forced families once again to spend time together. Mary was there for her son. In the book about fatherhood entitled How to Be a Hero to Your Kids, Josh McDowell said there's a formula for raising a rebellious child. He said rules minus a relationship equals rebellion. The only way to prevent foolish rebellion is to establish a positive relationship with your children, which can only happen by being there with your child. Ask any professional educator or law enforcement official about the percentage of children with major behavioral problems, and they'll tell you in most cases it involves kids who do not have sufficient supervision. Their parent is not there. To effectively provide and protect a child, a parent needs to follow the example of Mary. No parent is perfect. We all make mistakes, but may it be said of us, my mom, my dad was there. Not only would you see the location of love, but notice also this admission of limitation. When Mary learns of the need for wine, she goes to Jesus. Why? She realizes that she lacks the resources and the skills to solve the problem. She knows the one who does possess the power and the resources to meet that need. And it is a humbling and liberating truth to realize you don't have all the answers or the resources to solve every problem. As I was preparing this message, I was thinking about when my son got interested in fishing, and I didn't know anything about it. I still don't know a whole lot about it. But fortunately, we had some men in our church like David Anchors and Richard Brown and Alex Johnson who were willing to take my son and teach him what they knew about fishing. Sometimes we have to admit our own limitations. Mary does that. Most mothers are problem solvers. They have an unusual gift for making sure a task gets completed, even if it means making some adjustments along the way. Moms find a way to get things done, either through hard work or incredible ingenuity. Moms don't make excuses. They just get the job done, and they expect you to get your work done too. Nothing irritates a mother more than to have a child or her husband who knows a task needs to be done, but the person responsible fails to do what's expected. Moms don't operate with that type of luxury. They understand that if they don't get their job done, the whole family crumbles into chaos. Most moms have had the experience of saying to those entrusted to her care, I had to do a thousand things for the family today. And all I asked you to do was one thing. How difficult is it to do one thing? But it is a wise mom who recognizes there are some tasks There are some needs, there are some things that are greater than her super mom resources. It's a wise mother who brings those requests and those needs to Jesus. Mothers, you can do most things, but you can't do everything, and that's okay. God sent a Savior because we all need help. In the song or in the service today, we sang the song, Lord, I Need You, which reminds us of our dependence upon Christ to meet our needs. I love the lyrics from the great hymn, I Must Tell Jesus. It's a good word for us today. The song says, I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever cares and loves for his own. And then the chorus simply says, I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear these burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, 
I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. Mary's an example to all of us because she recognizes that she needs Jesus to meet this need, and she goes to him, admitting her own limitations and asking Christ, who has the power and the resources to meet that need. She's an example for us all because she demonstrates the location of love and the wisdom to admit limitations, but now also look at her instruction to follow the leader. Mary gives the best advice ever spoken by any person when she says, do whatever he tells you to do. In other words, she's saying Jesus is the leader. You should follow his instruction. Why? Because Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of the Most High God. He's the King of kings, Lord of lords. Therefore, we should follow him without reservation. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Mary didn't know what Jesus was going to do, but she knew it would probably be something the disciples had never done before. And she wanted to emphasize that they should not second guess or doubt Jesus' instruction, but to follow him wholeheartedly. Last week, my brother called me to tell me that our former basketball coach had been admitted to the hospital. He was battling uh, cancer and was having to receive a bone transfusion, and he asked me to pray for Coach Hudlow. We prayed for him, and uh, as I was preparing this message, I thought of some of the experiences with, with Coach Hudlow, and I remember on one occasion in a practice, some of the one of the players questioned what Coach Hudlow had asked us to do, and I remember Coach saying, listen, guys, when I say jump, your only response is to say how is to say yes, sir, on the way up. In other words, Coach was saying, don't question my authority or reasoning for the work that we're doing today. I'm the coach. I know what's best for the team as we prepare for the next game. When I say jump, you say yes, sir, on the way up. I've even used that with my children. I wish I could say it was successful. I would tell them maybe they had some task they had to do, some chore that was need to do, needed to be done. I would tell them to do it, clean up this mess. They would usually tell me it wasn't their fault. It was their sibling who did it. And I would say, listen, when I tell you to jump, you say yes, sir, on the way up. They would usually cock their head and like a dog that looks confused and say, well, you want us to jump? And then I would just say, never mind, just just do what I, I told you to do. Notice Mary in the text, though, says, do whatever he tells you to do without question, without reservation, do it wholeheartedly. The best advice any mother can provide her children is to teach them to follow Christ without reservation. While no person can cause another person to believe in Christ as Savior and Lord, we can point people to Jesus. By telling the disciples, do what he says, Mary was expressing her own faith, that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was the one who had the power and the resources to meet every need. She was also expressing her desire for other people to follow Christ. We see this truth illustrated in other passages. For example, even in the Old Testament, we read about Noah. And while most people remember Noah for his obedience to build the ark, even though it had never rained before, the Scripture says he's obedient to God, he builds the ark. But his greatest accomplishment was not building of a boat. His greatest accomplishment was getting his family on the boat. Sometimes we forget when it says that God looked around the earth and he was troubled and Noah was the only one that found favor with God. That meant his family didn't find favor with God either. But Moses, or excuse me, Noah through his preaching, the Bible calls him a preacher of righteousness, was able to convince his family to get on the boat and they were saved. King David was not a perfect king. He was not a perfect husband or a perfect father. But he was a man who had a heart for God and his family knew it. David's love for God was a blessing upon his family. He would write in Psalm 112, verses 1 and 2, Blessed are those who fear the Lord and greatly delight in his commands, for his children will be mighty in the land, and the generation of the upright will be blessed. One of my favorite verses in the Bible comes from one of the shortest books and often overlooked letters of the New Testament. It's contained in the little studied book of Third John. 3 John verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to know that my children are walking in the truth. 
Imagine all the things that the Apostle John experienced and would have brought joy into his life. He was there when Jesus performed miracles, not only the turning of the water to the wine. He was there when he caused the blind to see. He was there when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He heard Jesus preach and teach about the kingdom like no one had ever taught before. John wrote the book of Revelation after receiving amazing prophetic visions. He was there at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified, and he saw the empty tomb on Resurrection Sunday. Yet even with all of those joyful experiences in his long life, historians report that he lived almost to be 90 years of age. He said, the greatest joy in my life is knowing that my children walk in the truth. Parents, teach your children to follow Christ. In closing, I want to share a story about a junior high school teacher who was teaching the class about the properties of magnets. The next day, he gave the students a quiz The first question on the quiz simply said, my name begins with an M. It has six letters. I pick things up. Half of the kids in the junior high class wrote mother for the answer. Mother, sometimes I know you feel like your life is spent picking up toys or picking up clothes or picking up dishes or picking up your kids from some event. But no, one of the greatest gifts that God has given you is the privilege to pick up a child when they fall, to pick up a child when they're scared or confused, to pick up a child when their heart is broken, to pick up a child when they're discouraged and point them to Christ. The mother of Jesus was there. May that be said of all parents. I'm going to ask if you would just to bow with me in prayer right there in your car. We're not going to engage in a formal invitation today, but I want you to know that any time that the Word of God is shared, we want to give people an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And maybe today you feel like God is tugging your heart. Maybe today you respond and think about the love that your mother has shown knowing that she demonstrated that love to you because of the love of Christ in her heart. And I want to encourage you today, if you've never called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, that you would do so today. That right where you're seated or watching us online, that you would pray something like this, Dear God, in the name of Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died for my sin and rose from the dead, just like the scriptures say. Today, Lord, by grace, through faith, I repent of my sin and receive the free gift of eternal life. Forgive me and save me in Jesus' name. With heads still bowed, I want to encourage you to get in touch with us somehow. Let us know about that decision. But I want to conclude our time today by once again praying for mothers. Father God, it is in the name of Jesus that we continue to call upon you, admitting that we need you. I pray that the mothers today would turn to you, that they would seek you, that they would recognize that you are a source of strength and wisdom. I pray that you would meet their every need according to your riches and glory. I pray that they would experience once again the honor that is due to them on this day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. Happy Mother's Day. Watch the deacons and they'll tell you how to get out of the parking lot. Thank you so much for coming.